Good morning, dear church family. We're here gathered together in his name, and though we can't be together physically, we are together in spirit, and that is a beautiful thing. Before we get started, I would like you to set up your little worship space. You can put a cross like we have on the altar. You can put a little candle and light it to remind us that God is with us. Uh, just so grateful to Linda for bringing us that beautiful arrangement, which we can keep using. And you see the cross and the palm leaves here. Also, if you haven't yet, you may want to go and print up the bulletin that I emailed you yesterday. It has all the words to the hymns and the prayers. And it also has Lenten devotions for this week so that you can join in that as well. Corporate Bible study is a wonderful thing. Let's read together Psalm 23 from your bulletin. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me, your rod and your staff comfort me. You prepare a table for me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. Let's join together in praying. Father God, we thank you for this time together. We pray you anoint it with your Holy Spirit, that you be with us, that you illuminate our minds with your holy words, that you encourage our hearts, that you be with us through all of this, Lord. Father, things look dark right now, so we turn toward your light. And we ask, Lord, that we reflect that light to all around us. Lord, we lift up this world to you, and we pray your mercy. Have mercy on this sin-filled world, Lord. Have mercy on this world that rejects its own creator. Have mercy on each one. Dear Lord, have mercy. Have mercy. Have mercy on us. Oh, Father, we turn to you today, and our hearts are broken with the weight of our willfulness and our pride and our sin. And we cry out to you to deliver us. Deliver all of us, Lord. And in the midst of all of this, may your people shine brightly. May we offer the great hope that we have been given, that you are our God, that you love us, and that you sent your precious Son to die for us when we were still your enemy. Lord, help us to take this moment to cry out to these, the lost, the broken, the ill. God is there. God is real. And God loves you. Help us, Lord, to carry this message to all around us. Father, I lift up my precious congregation, the people of your heart. I pray your protection over every one of them. I pray your encouragement. I pray your faith be enlarged in them, Lord. May they stand firm, knowing that you are there for them. May they stand firm unwaveringly in their faith, Lord. Lord, where there is fear, replace it with faith. Where there is illness, replace it with health. Where there is grief, replace it with your gladness. Where there is anything, Lord, that is not of you, I pray that you fill that person with a full awareness of your presence with them always. And I thank you for hearing these prayers, dear Father. And we add to this the prayers that your dear son taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on this earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses 
as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Folks, this would be our offering time. And we're not here together. So I would ask instead that you in your heart put your offerings in this place right now to the Lord. Whether it be your offerings of selflessness in the ways that you reach out to your neighbors. Whether it be your offerings of faith in the face of fear. Whether it be your offerings of the encouraging word that you share with each other. Think of the offering that you can place in this plate today in spirit and give it to our great Lord. Let's sing the doxology together. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise him all creatures here below. Praise him above the heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. And now if you will join with me in our hymn of worship. Words are right there in your bulletin, so I hope you'll sing it with me. Rock of ages, cleft for me. Let me hide myself in thee. Let the with you. We're going to turn to Psalm 91, which is about in the middle of your Bible. I'll give you a moment to turn to it. It's been a tough time hasn't it, my sweet family? It's been a time of uncertainty, a time of fear. We don't know how long this will last, and we don't know what we're going to face when it's all over. And we wouldn't be human if we wouldn't be afraid right now. So we're going to turn to our loving God and see what he would say to us right now. Let's look at Psalm 91 together. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. Isn't that a beautiful, beautiful image? It makes me think of a little child who's been afraid, and he runs to his parent, and he snuggles up in that parent's arms, and he rests his head on that parent's heart. 
and that parent experiences that wonderful delight in that intimate, trusting moment. And we are God's children, and he longs for nothing more than for us to run to him and share that intimate and trusting moment. But how do we do it when everything around us seems to be falling apart? Well, let's look at verse 2. I will say to the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. The psalmist is speaking aloud who God is to him. When we speak things aloud, they become real to us. When we speak things aloud, the enemy hears our faith stand up against him. When we speak things aloud, our will awakens and it stiffens our backbones. When we speak things aloud, we encourage everyone within earshot. So let's say it together. God is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. Let's say it again. God is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. He is our refuge, our hiding place. He is our fortress, our stronghold. Let's look at the comforting words that we find in verse 3. It starts out with the word surely. This means definitely, without a doubt. Surely, definitely, without a doubt, God will save you from the fowler's snare. So what is a fowler's snare? It's things in this world that are hostile toward us. It can be the work of another human being. It can be the work of an addiction. It can be the work of a false prophet who seeks to pull us off the way that leads to eternal life. But God is saying, without a doubt, I will save you from any act of man, any creation of man that might entrap you. What a beautiful comfort. What else does he say? Surely, without a doubt, I will save you from the deadly pestilence. And what a beautiful promise to hold on to in these times. God has us taken care of, my friend. No matter what man might do, no matter what nature might do. In verse 4, we find out how he will save us. He will cover us with his feather. Isn't that a beautiful analogy? Jesus referred to this as he looked over Jerusalem and he said, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets, stone those who sent you, how often I have longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you would not. Can you hear the longing in our Lord's voice? We find shelter under his wings. Think about the mother bird keeping her chicks warm and safe and dry and close. The chicks are sheltered as long as they remain under the mother's wings. And that's our choice. We can choose to stay close to God under his shelter, or we can choose to leave and go out on our own. So how do we know that that is a trustworthy statement? The psalmist assures us that God's faithfulness will be our shield and our rampart. And what is a rampart? A rampart is a wall that is built around a city and it has a broad walkway around the top of it. And that's where the soldiers stand to guard and defend the city. We are walled in by God. He goes before us, he goes behind us, and he surrounds us at all times. And that's the work of the God who will not change. He is forever the same, compassionate, merciful God who calls us to him over and over and over. He is the father waiting for the prodigal's return, searching the horizon for that distant figure. He is the son hanging on the cross, paying that ultimate price for our eternity. He is our healer, 
our provider, our guide, and our guard forever. Verse 5, what is the result of being surrounded by the Almighty God? We will not fear. What will we not fear? The terror of the night, which is a really good description of fear of the unknown, isn't it? The darkness represents our inability to identify what threatens us, but the things we cannot name will not make us afraid because we trust in God's faithfulness. We will not fear the arrow that flies by day or any work of man that may seek to harm us. We will not fear the pestilence, the epidemic that stalks in the darkness. We will not fear the plague, the calamity, the influx of noxious creatures that destroys at midday. We will not fear. Think of the Egyptians during Moses' time. Think of how the Israelites must have felt as they watched the eldest sons of all the Egyptians fall around them, and yet not one of their children was harmed. No matter what, no matter when, our God has promised to keep us safe because we trust in his faithfulness. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. We will not fear because that is a natural response for people who have found a place of safety, isn't it? Verse 7, the thought, psalmist says, don't worry about what you see happening around you. Though a thousand fall at our side or 10,000 at our right hand, it will not come near us. No matter what we see on television, no matter what we read in the news, no matter what we find on Facebook, if we're sheltering under God's wings, it cannot come near us. God, who neither slumbers nor sleeps, is keeping us in the palm of his hand. And the psalmist says, we will see it with our own eyes. Now the psalmist addresses what our responsibility is in the midst of all these promises. In verse 9, it begins with, if. <clears throat> If you make the Most High your dwelling, even the Lord, who is my refuge. If is the variable, the choice. We can choose to make God our dwelling, or we can try and rely on something else, can't we? So what happens when we choose to make the Most High God our dwelling? No harm will befall us. No disaster come near us. In verse 11, he says, God will command his angels, his divine messengers, to guard us. They will keep on anything from impeding us as we walk in the way that God has commanded us. We won't even stub our toe on a stone. Even when things look frightening and insurmountable, lions or cobras, things that could destroy us, we're not going to fear because we'll be able to walk right over them. Why? Because God has a perfect will for our lives. And the only thing that can impede that perfect will is we ourselves. If we make the Most High our dwelling, we are secure. So what does it mean to make the Most High our dwelling? If we look in John chapter 15, we will find Jesus giving to his disciples their marching order, so to speak. He says he is the true vine, and he calls his disciples, us, his branches. A vine grows because it is in good soil and has strong roots. Do you note that we are not required to find good soil or grow good roots because our precious Lord has provided that for us. What is required of us? That we remain in him. We don't have to find a way to get attached to the vine. We already are. But what does it mean to remain in Jesus? It means to draw our life from him, to grow as he designs, 
to bear the fruit that he declares. But how do we do this? Well, we draw our life from him when his word has taken root in our hearts. I have hidden your words in my heart so I might not sin against you, says the psalmist. I've said it before my family, and I will say it again and again. You will not have a strong faith if you do not read your Bible. If you think you can have it, you will fail. This, this is our food. This is what helps us grow in our faith. Read your Bible. And since you're stuck at home right now, there's no better time to do it. So how do we grow in his design for us? Through prayer. Through seeking his face and listening for his voice so that we can recognize our shepherd's voice when he speaks to us. I'm an expert at growing sad little house plants. They're all spindly and weak. Do you know why? I bet you do. They don't get enough sunlight. We receive the light of God's Son when we bask in His presence, when we turn our faces toward Him in prayer, when we draw near to Him. So how do we bear fruit then? Well, when we share the results of our study and our prayer with others, we can't help but do so. Jesus didn't say we would bear fruit whenever we felt like it. In fact, he said if we don't bear fruit, the Father will prune us away. That sounds cruel, doesn't it? But bearing fruit is the natural outcome, <clears throat> excuse me, outcome of receiving nourishment from the vine and the sunlight. It is we who decide that we don't want to receive those things from our Heavenly Father. God stands ready to be the master gardener of our lives, and it's up to us to decide if we wish to remain attached under his watchful care. Jesus then takes his analogy a step further. He says, as the Father has loved me, so I love you. I want you to think about that. We are loved with an eternal, divine love. As God, the Heavenly Father, the Creator of all that is, loves His only Son, that's how we're loved. And what does Jesus say? Remain in my love. Don't walk away from it. Keep my commandments, my instructions, and remain in my love. Keep my commandments. Back to Psalm 91 and verse 14, it says, Because he loves me, says the Lord, I will rescue him. The natural result of our love is that God will rescue us and protect us. When we are about the business of serving God for his glory, God takes care of everything else, doesn't he? That is how we acknowledge his name. It is by witnessing to all those around us that God is the giver of all that is good in our lives, and he is the source of our strength, and he gives us his salvation. In verse 15, it says, He will call upon me, and I will answer him. And that's the result of a life filled with prayer. How do we know he has answered us? My sheep know my voice, says Jesus. We recognize his voice, and thus we know when we have been answered. God, our ever-present help in time of need, assures us that he will be with us in times of trouble. And the interesting thing about this is that God does not promise there will be no trouble. He hasn't carried us off to some desert island where there's no pestilence or plague or arrows. God instead has promised to be with us. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, you are with me. Always and always. We don't need 
his faithfulness to be our shield and rampart if we were not facing a battle with him. But we don't fear because our God has promised to deliver us and to honor us. How are we honored? Are we made to look like all that in a bag of chips before the world just because we believe? No. God honors us in that though we are so undeserving, the Most High God, the Almighty, the Everlasting, knows our needs, knows our names, and stoops down from his glorious throne to rescue us. Verse 16. With long life will I satisfy him and show him my salvation. Folks, at some point, this physical body is going to die. Whether it be from an accident or illness or just because we wear out, this body will die. But God gives us our greatest hope. He shows us his salvation, and he has shown it to us through the sacrifice and resurrection of his precious son, Jesus. This world is not our home, and we look with hope to life everlasting with our God, whom we then will see face to face. Praise God. Who of you, by worrying, can add a single hour to his life, Jesus asked. Don't be concerned about what you will eat or drink. Your Father knows you need these things. But instead, seek first the kingdom of God, and all these things will be added to you. Fear not, little flock. It is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Amen. And now let's join together in our hymn of service. God will take care of you.
And now, sweet friends, let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you for being with us in this time. Thank you for drawing near to us as we draw near to you. Thank you for showing us your nature through your word. Thank you for inspiring us by your Holy Spirit. Help us to take this blessed assurance that you have given us today out into the world to encourage others and let them see your light and give them that great hope which we have. In Jesus' name, amen. Let there be peace.